Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Galderma. Hi, I'm Jerry Tan, adjunct professor at Western University in London, Ontario, in Canada. Welcome to this program entitled The Role of Retinoid Receptor Signaling in Acne Pathology, Pathophysiology, and Treatment. Joining me today is Hilary Baldwin, who is Clinical Associate Professor at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Hi, Hilary. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Jerry. Thank you very much for inviting me. We know that uh, acne affects 85% of adolescents and can continue in many into adulthood. And retinoids have been a mainstay of treatment for almost 50 years now. And with Hillary's help, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper to discuss how they function in the cell and what that means for acne treatment. Hillary, could you help illuminate us? Sure. I think we've been talking an awful lot about nuclear retinoid receptors in the recent past. So I think it warrants us taking a little bit of a deeper dive into the subject. There are two families of receptors, retinoid X receptors and retinoid acid receptors, both of which come in alpha, beta, and gamma. Now these retinoids bind to each other and bind to themselves, and the effect that they have within the cell is because they are both homodimers or heterodimers. So as you see here, retinoic acid attempts to get into the cell it is escorted into the nucleus by binding proteins, where it joins with either a homodimer of RAR, RAR, or RXR, RXR, or a heterodimer of the two of them. And then it activates specific locations and different regions on the DNA. There are many such regions, which are called retinoic acid receptor elements. And then genes are either upregulated or downregulated that result in keratinocyte differentiation and proliferation, uh, immune response, inflammation, and tissue remodeling. And we can see how all of these together would be so important in both reducing inflammatory as well as comedonal lesions of acne and the possibility of it reducing acne scarring. Now, you know, we've been talking a lot about the retinoid receptors. And I hope that with this slide, you recognize that we have six different subsets of receptors. They form homo or heterodimers. They bind to numerous different places on the DNA. So this is not nearly as simple as we've been making it out to be. So I've heard though, Jerry, that not all retinoids are created equal. Is that true? That's so true, Hillary. And you know, part of the difference is regarding their of course, the, when they were conceived and arrived on the market, for example, tretinoin arrived almost uh, 50 years ago and adapting to xeratine about a decade after that and triferritine was uh, released just two years ago. Tretinoin, isotretinoin, they both have RAR, alpha, beta, and gamma specificities. Adapting and tazeratine, primarily beta and gamma specificities, and then triferritine, much more specific for RAR gamma. And gamma is the most prevalent receptor in the skin. Now, we're unclear if these differences truly have clinical relevance, but there are two issues here. One is that it may permit triferritine to be more efficacious at a very low concentration, and because it's bound so heavily in the skin, to also have less risk of systemic absorption. Recently, we completed a study looking at triferritine in two randomized controlled trials that were vehicle controlled and demonstrated that both on the face, which is, of course, a traditional site of acne clinical trial interest, but in this one, we also included truncal acne because that's such an, a previously neglected area of acne research. 
So we evaluated triferritine both on face and trunk and found that there was evidence of efficacy in global assessments as well as lesion count reduction in both of those regions. And importantly, there was also clear evidence that there was good levels of tolerability of triferritine at face and trunk. And this uh, product is still going to be undergoing more evaluations in phase four, including the potential for, potential for mitigating acne scarring. So it's, a, it's an exciting time for what's happening with topical retinoids again, because part of where we're at now is the fact that in the past, we've had signals from topical retinoids that they could be very helpful in matrix repair. For example, Jenny Kim's group demonstrated that the P acnes um, in vitro could induce a matrix degradation phenotype. But in the presence of all transretinoic acid, it shifted it to a matrix preservation phenotype. So that was extremely helpful in at least in vitro work, demonstrating that perhaps there was evidence of mitigation of scarring. Then a few years ago, there was a study done out of uh, Baltimore demonstrating that twice daily use of adapting 0.3% in patients who only had acne scarring, no active acne, only scarring, demonstrated excellent improvement in overall appearance of scars over a course of six months. So I think those are really exciting times for um, the use of topical retinoids beyond simply treating acne. You know, since triferritine is so new, we don't have a lot of data. Uh, and as you mentioned, we've got a phase four study that's looking into the amelioration uh, or prevention of scars and acne with triferritine. But we do have some data on existing retinoids that help us to recognize that it is entirely possible that triferritine also will reduce scarring. So with tretinoin, which is a first-generation retinoid, you mentioned we've had that since 1971. So many of these studies are quite old. You have to look back to find them. But there are studies that show improvement in cosmesis of existing scars with tretinoin, as well as prevention of development of scars after procedures, such as resurfacing techniques back in the dark ages, things like dermabrasion, um, and also following some procedures that we do, like EDNC of basal cells. And this is probably due to the interaction with retinoids and matrix metalloproteinases that you just mentioned, Jerry. There's also the third generation retinoids, which of course have also been shown to be highly efficacious in the treatment of acne, but also in scarring. A brand new study for tazeratine 0.1% gel versus microneedling in a split face that showed equivalence of improvement. And the three studies that you mentioned for adapalene, 0.3% gel for six months and two split face studies with adapalene plus benzoyl peroxide in various concentrations for six months. Together, these three studies showed an improvement in existing acne scars, as well as a prevention of the formation of additional scars in our acne patients. So I think this is a very important issue. I totally agree with you, Hilary, and I was wondering about whether you think there are any patients that would not be appropriate for topical retinoid use. Well, I have to look long and hard to find them. I'm of the belief that retinoids are appropriate for all acne patients of all severities from the very first pimple to the complete resolution of all of their lesions, including perhaps now their scars as well. So the only patients that I think it's not appropriate for are perhaps my pregnant patients. Although, as we well know, there's very, very little data indicating that they are absorbed to any extent, that once they get absorbed, that they're any different than endogenous circulating retinoids that one might get from eating a sweet potato or a red pepper, uh, or that it increases the risk of retinoid embryopathy. And again, these things have been out since 1971. So I sort of feel if it was going to happen, that we would know about it already. Uh, I certainly don't recommend it to my pregnant patients, but uh, if someone calls me up and says, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant, uh, and I've been on uh, retinoid whatever for the last three months, do I need to worry? I tell them no. What, what do you say to your patients? I completely agree. I think that 
the it's important for us to just be aware of that potential risk, but of not seeing that actually manifest. Um, nevertheless, I think it's wise of us to just be uh, indicating to patients to be a little cautious, especially if they're trying to get pregnant or pregnant. And typically, as you do, I would recommend that they discontinue um, if they are trying to actively get pregnant or are pregnant. I wanted to ask you, when do you actually recommend starting a patient on topical retinoids? For example, um, is it only in patients who have primarily comedonal acne, mixed, or does it really matter? I use topical retinoids for everyone. Uh, we have plenty of data that demonstrate that it, they're not just for comedonal acne, that they work very well for inflammatory lesions as well. And I recommend that they start as early as possible. But I have one caveat here. Sometimes we have very young patients, like nine-year-olds, um, who are exhibiting their very first acne lesions. And I'm very worried about them in terms of the potential for topical retinoids to cause irritation. Very cognizant of the fact that if I start irritating somebody at nine, the chances of future compliance uh, may be greatly reduced. So with the younger patients, I'm a little bit more careful with uh, application techniques and things of that, of that nature. But otherwise, as early as possible, I, I think is the appropriate answer to that question. Thank you for that. And, you know, I think the commonly seen adverse events that um, probably all clinicians see with top of retinoids are issues like skin irritation, dryness, flaking. How do you mitigate the risk of some of those adverse events developing? Well, we know, of course, that they're going to be at their absolute worst a week to two weeks in. And so the first thing I do is to warn the patients. <laughs> Adequate mm -hmm. education is very important with topical retinoids and make sure that they realize that the first couple of weeks may not be all that easy. But when they get past that, things are going to get much better. And I go back to thinking about the nine-year-old with just a couple of comedones compared to perhaps an older patient with a lot of acne lesions. Those the patients who have more severe disease, I think are more willing to go through the pain to get to the gain than is a nine-year-old who may not even care about the few comedones that they have on their nose. So uh, telling them that they're gonna get over this is, is a big help. And then of course, the use of moisturizers. What do you think about moisturizers? Are you a before the use of retinoids guy or an after the use of retinoids guy? Well, you know, I, th I think there are so few studies that actually address that, Hillary. So I, I try to encourage patients, uh, much like you do, to try to mitigate the dryness and the scaling, because I think that's primarily a skin barrier issue, mm -hmm. whereas irritation is probably an uh, underlying inflammatory issue. So when I initiate uh, topical retinoids in patients, I will recommend that they start it every second or every third night, because that does seem to reduce irritation, whereas it doesn't make a big difference to dryness and scaling. So for that, I would recommend that they use uh, moisturizers, non-comedogenic. If they tend to be very oily, I would recommend that they use hydrating agents as opposed to pure moisturizers, which contain a little bit more um, oil and hydrating containing a little bit more water and more uh, hyaluronic acid. So it really depends on your choice of product. And um, what I really like to do is to encourage them to use it together but at least five minutes apart. And that yeah. five minutes gives them a chance to brush their teeth. <laughs> Kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> Absolutely. I love the idea. So do you, when do you tell a patient it's okay to stop their retinoids? So supposing they, you know, they haven't had an active acne lesion in a year and mm -hmm. they still do have some small acne scars, perhaps some shallow ones. Do you recommend that they continue using their retinoids for years and years? You know, topical retinoids, as you and I both know, transition from acne care to skin aging. Yes. Right. And in between that is that transition stage of acne scarring. So quite frankly, they can continue using it if they wish. I mean, if the, the only reason to stop is probably it's one less thing for them to put on their skin. 
Right. But, you know, I also think that there are a lot of very, um, very thoughtful patients that realize that, you know, maybe mom's using retinols. This is a topical retinoid. Why can't I keep it going? And I'm totally fine with that until they get to the point where they're maybe looking at starting a family. And then those young women may want to consider giving it a little bit of a break time. Yep. So we know that topical retinoids have been shown to be helpful in scar prevention and scar repair. And I wanted to just conclude that Retinoid receptor signaling is key in the maintenance of skin health. And retinoids activate RAR, RXR in the nucleus to activate target genes involved in cell differentiation, inflammation, and repair, which is how they actually are so helpful in both the active inflammatory acne process as well as the scar uh, repair process. Topical retinoids remain a mainstay for treatment for all patients with acne and should be considered for patients with acne scarring. Hillary, I want to thank you for this great discussion. It's always a pleasure to be chatting with you and having conversations about this and other topics that are near and dear to our heart. It's been a pleasure, Jerry. Thank you. And I want to thank you for participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the questions that follow, and please complete the evaluation as well.